Okay, a um, couple of notes. If you don't want to uh, be seen, make sure you turn your video off. I think there probably won't be enough people in this session that it, it should affect uh, quality. Um, if it does start to um, affect anything for people that are maybe in places where the connection is not so great, we can, uh, we can turn it off. Um, please make sure to mute your microphone unless you're speaking. I know I'm at home and, you know, fire trucks fire back and forth and my dog likes to bark at the door. Um, so I apologize for that in advance since I'll probably be off mute a lot. But um, again, if you're, if you're not speaking, it's, it's great to try to keep it on mute for people. Um, obviously, if you're here, it's not actually Meet Echo. I should probably change that and change the WebEx. Um, there's minutes, there's a link there. Again, that's where I would like everyone to log in and um, uh, put up their, their, their name and affiliation. Um, if you don't have a, a, a data tracker account, that's okay. You can send it, send it to the chairs um, and we can upload it, which is just mls-chairs at itf.org. Um, here's the note well. Um, you know, these are the policies in effect during an official meeting, and this is one. Um, code of conduct, it's both mo mostly about making sure if you uh, know about patents and the like that you would announce them now, um, or at least if you're going to participate. Um, and we can help you through that whole process. Um, again, you know, participating, it's, it's anything from written audio and video. Um, uh, we got some GDPR related kind of stuff with the privacy statements. Um, you know, basically we want people to be uh, professional, keep things courteous. And then we have a bunch of VCPs about, you know, what you need to, to do to, you know, to be in uh, compliance with those. And so if anybody has any questions about those, we can, we can certainly answer the questions. And this is us. Uh, is Nick here? Actually, I started the thing and I didn't even look. I'm here. Okay, great. Hey, it's Nick and I. <laughs> um, today. Our agenda, we're going to go through some, we did some meeting tips, some note well, some virtual blue sheets, which I noted already. We are going to need a note taker. Is anyone willing to volunteer to take notes that end up in the Cody MD? And really what we care about is like, issue number, pull request, maybe some general discussions about the topic and the actual resolution that's made. We're not looking for blow by blow minutes where you're trying to get all the words down um, that everybody says, because we all know we can kind of go kind of quick. Is anybody willing to volunteer? Take some notes when it comes. I'm going to take the notes anyway, so I can provide them to you guys as well. That's excellent, Richard. It's worked in the past. I appreciate you stepping up for us. Um, uh, we don't really use Jabber in this thing. So if there anybody is anybody in, if anybody is in Jabber, and if anything comes up, please feel free to kind of you know bring it to our attention, and we can we can review it live. Um, the two drafts on you know on tap today are the protocol and architecture draft. Um, we're basically just going to go to the GitHub repo and kind of work through those because there's no real um, presentations. I just kind of want to give everybody kind of a status if they haven't been kind of following along. Um, this is kind of the timeline for the MLS protocol. We've been in this kind of feature freeze and analysis. Um, the only thing I did from the last time I showed this is that I moved the arrow to say we are here closer to the draft dash 12 thing in the middle. So since we have dash 11, we've been kind of waiting, um, letting people go through and analyze it and, and take a look at it to see if there's anything that would like to change. And so we're kind of at the point where we want to wrap that all up. Um, I want to make sure a that we you know properly address or close all the issues um, and pull requests that are out there, and to make sure that the analysis has actually been done before we kind of like push forward. That will you know inevitably result in a dash twelve, um, just based on the number of PRs that I saw. That we're definitely going to have a dash twelve, and then what we'll do is we'll do something called a working group last call, which is a two week hey speak now or forever hold your peace, um, and we'll try to get those on new issues that are brought up to try to narrow the scope but we'll see what happens, happens. And then depending upon whether there's changes that are needed as a result of that, that working group last call, we'd have another draft. And then there's another thing called AD review, which is where our air director, who's the, the kind of the person shepherding this working group will take a review. And if they have comments, then we have to address those and you may need that. And then after that, there's an IETF last call. And as a result of that, there may be another draft. There's ISG review, which is the, the body that approves the, the, the the internet draft for publication. And then there might be another one after that. And then there's an RFC editor slash off 48 um, time, which is where they're kind of doing some copy editing 
and things. And there might be changes as a result of that, you know, yada, yada, yada. But at the end, hopefully we're going for the blue star where we uh, get out the door. Um, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions about that, the process for what we're, we're expected to do? And just for folks who haven't been through this process, um, ideally the, the scope of the changes gets smaller and smaller as we go along here and we are uh, addressing finer and finer points. Um, and I think in terms of time, uh, my hope is to get this into working group last call, say by the end of this week, if we can get things agreed and merged. Uh, I saw you know, that, that was the reaction I wanted to get out of the chair. Um, end of this week or next week. Um, and so if we can do that, we can have the working group last call kind of run through this month uh, toward, you know, and kind of end around the IETF meeting in November. And I think if we do that, we can probably get, um, you know, th this whole timeline can probably kind of play out kind of between now and end of year, early part of 22. So that would be the, yeah, the I, overall overall horizon. Right, so as, as Richard noted, the, the amount of changes, um, hopefully we're getting less and less. Uh, I will say that I think that the um, propensity or willingness to accept kind of blanket crazy changes, like, hey, let's redo this thing and rethink about it, starts to go down as we start to do these working group last calls because it's like we've we've got some implementation experience not saying we can't change it if we find a bug but if people are like hey there's a new way we could do this and it's like Mwah. so there, yep. there's there ends up being more pushback on changes so kind of now is your you know get 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 in what you need to do now the only other thing that i would add to what richard noted is is that as we go to the isg um there's no way this protocol document is going to get through the the steering group because it's the Internet Engineering Steering Group, and they're going to read this protocol document and be like, huh? And the first thing they're going to say is, where's your architecture draft? So at the end, when we go forward through the ISG, we pretty much have to have both done. And so there's no real requirement that if we get the protocol document through that we immediately go to the next stage, we can wait a little bit. Um, but it it's, would be nice that we could kind of progress them kind of both at the same pace. And I saw that Benjamin produced a Dash 07 this morning with uh, lots of changes. So hopefully that one's moving along as well. And that's another draft that we'll talk about today. So, I mean, it would be great if we could knock this all out and get to the ISG by the end of the year. I think it's probably a little unrealistic, but you know, you, you never know. So, all right, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and then I'm gonna go over and share an application. And I don't have anything open. I think I care about everyone seeing, so let's go. Uh, where is the document? Documents. Nope, definitely so not that. Pro protocol first or architecture first? Um, I don't know. Is Benjamin here? I don't look. I think the protocol document needs more work. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's do that. Um, let's go screen. Why can't I, I share? Don't, I don't see Benjamin in the. All right, well that that's problem. that solves that solves that problem anyways. So why can I not share? What is that? I think share the screen. Block temporarily. How about unblock that? There we go. Uh, ding, 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 ding. Let's do that. Wow. Okay, I'll share that. So hopefully you guys will be able to see. I will jump over to the. Can you see that now? Where I'm in the repo. Yep, we see you. All right, great. So let's just jump to the protocol draft. All right, where would we like to start? So I think the issues mostly get are mostly addressed by the PRs. Um, so I would suggest we jump into the PRs because I think there's a bunch here we can kind of just review and and merge maybe even on the call. Um, so I think we have, uh, so I think I might suggest starting at the bottom with 454, four, assuming we have both Hubert and uh, Raphael on the call, so, which I think we do. Because um, I, I think that's close to, we've been obviously working on that for a little while, and I think it's close to being done, but there's still a little bit of disagreement. You want to click into 454 four there? Um, I admit, I am not, I've missed the last couple of round trips on this. 
I had thought it was ready to merge, but Raphael, I think, had some comments. Raphael, do you want to comment on what your concerns are? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I made a last minute comment there um, because I find it sort of uh, difficult to follow why Hubert is proposing three different ratcheting trees when at least I only see two of them. Richard, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So um, Hubert actually just re re replied on the PR a few minutes ago, um, and I think oh, I, okay. I agree with his his view. So basically, there's when you're applying a commit, you do two things to the tree. First, you apply all of the uh, proposals, so you do the adds and removes and whatnot, and then you uh, apply the update path that you have generated. So. Two changes means you have before, provisional, and after. Um, so I think that was that the, was kind of the terminology he was um, that is targeted that is implemented in the PR. Does that make separation make sense? Yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Hubert is in the call, by the way. Hubert, do you have audio? I notice this thing has been aggressively muting. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, yeah. A any further thoughts yeah. there, Hubert? Right. So it's essentially, you decompose um, updating the ratcheting tree in phase one, where you only apply the proposals, and then phase two, which, sorry, phase one is only at the leaf node level. And then phase two is everything concerning the update path, meaning the um, the rest of the tree, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, not not quite. So so maybe I need to reread the proposal if it says this. But um, the first phase is not just the leaves, um, but it's I guess leaves and blanking. So it's it's applying right. proposals yeah. is what it is. So if you apply a remove, say, you remove the leaf and then blank the path to the root. Um, so, so that's like proposals is the first phase, and then the update path is the second phase. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, you need to do some blanking perhaps when you're applying proposals. Um, you yeah, might have to, sorry, you might go have ahead. To add, you might have to also add, like, really change the structure of the tree if you're adding leaves, right? Well, uh, correct. At least add in uh, uh, unmerged leaves and stuff. Correct. Yeah, so I think another way to think of it is that the provisional tree, after all the proposals have been applied, represents the membership of the tree of the group after you know after the commit is applied uh, at the end of the whole thing, except for the uh, committer whose state will get set in the tree by the update path. Okay, so I think if we're, if we're clear on I'm, all that. I'm fine with the additional separation. Okay. Um, Raphael, maybe you could take a quick look after the call and see if the text that's in the PR matches your expectation um, or if there's any further um, uh, text tweaks that need to be done. But I think modulo that minor edit, this is ready to merge. Yeah, agreed. I'll have a look. Okay. You, you said modulo and minor edit. Was there a proposed edit, or I thought that uh, yeah, so, it was fine? Sorry. The, yeah. So, Raphael, as I, I think we all agree on the semantic. I think yeah. Raphael has the, has the action to take a, a, a quick look and make sure that the text captures the semantic accurately according to his reading. Okay. Um, so, there may be no change. There may be a minor change to, to make sure it aligns to, to the semantic we all agree on. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Does that kind um, of capture the? I'm trying to take notes in the actual PR. So I mean, as discussed at the interim, Raphael Robert to review if could then merge. I mean, great. Yep. That's, that's what I'm saying. All right. Excellent. 
Okie dokie. How about just the okay. back button? That'll work. All right. Which next one? 462? Uh, yep, that's what I was going to suggest. I think this one is just uh, editorial stuff. Thank you, for Brendan, for the revisions here. Um, I think this one's ready to merge. Um, I'm, oh, modulo one uh, knit that I found there. Um, assuming, Brendan, you don't object to that, um, I'll, I can commit that in the GitHub interface and merge the whole thing. Brendan on the call. No, Brendan is not here, but it's it's a correctness fix. So I'm, I'll, yeah, I'll go so ahead. You're, you're, I mean, yeah, you're saying for public keys and encrypted private keys, you're replacing private keys with path secrets. Yeah, because the, the thing you encrypt when you encrypt an update path is the path secret, not the private key. So it's, it's just a minor correctness fix. Um, so I will plan to uh, commit that uh, and then merge the whole thing, unless anyone has any remaining concerns with that. All right, we'll merge that one. Um, next I had, well, we can just kind of go in chronological order maybe here. Um, and, well, actually it's a little unfortunate Brendan is not here. All right, not Brendan. Well, actually neither Brendan nor, nor Benjamin are here. We're the two people who cared about this. So actually let's have some discussion about this since neither of these <laughs> folks who had strong opinions on this are here. Um, so here is the, the situation here is that we had added this app act proposal that allows uh, application messages to be acknowledged within the ML and, and for all of the, those acknowledgements to get committed within the MLS key schedule, um, which means that the delivery service can't suppress messages, can't suppress acknowledged messages um, without um, without it being noticed um, or without stopping the MLS key schedule. Um, this is comparable to some similar features in other ratchet-based protocols, which include um, acknowledgments um, in a, a kind of as, as part of the course of business. Um, so that, again, to try and address this risk of uh, messages being suppressed by, uh, by the delivery service. Um, I think Brendan's PR here notes that nobody has shown much interest in implementing this. It's also a fairly separable thing. Um, and so he proposes removing that feature uh, from, the main, from the spec here. Um, personally, I'm kind of on the fence. Um, I think this is a useful property to have in the core protocol, but it is not really essential to the core key exchange functionality of MLS. And I think with some of the um, proposal extensibility stuff we have elsewhere in the PR chain, it could be done as an extension proposal um, without a ton of complexity. So, you know, a, a plausible next step here. You know, if we if we agree to take this out, I think that the, the it, it would be good to kind of spin up a quick internet draft encoding this thing as an extension proposal so that we continue to have it documented somewhere. Um, so I'm kind of on the fence. Um, interested in feedback from other folks as to whether this is um, this kind of anti-suppression protection is something that's really important to have in the core protocol or whether we could have it as uh, an extension to it. Or is open. Yeah, as you mentioned, Benjamin is not here to defend that today, but I think one of the core arguments um, in favor of leaving it in was that this would make MLS on par with the signal protocol regarding that aspect. Yeah, I would have not. I think some of some of the other similar signal style protocols have this as well. So yeah, it, it would be comparable to other things that are out there. Yeah. Other folks. So if we're going to do it as an extension, um, I brought up a a point which, if you want to defer till later, but uh, do we want to have the ability to have Extent required extensions or mandatory extensions in an MLS group. I, I think that's that's a useful question, but I, I would propose we defer that required extensions question to 
So a bit later. Other folks have strong opinions or any any opinions really. Like you can use the little thumbs up, thumbs down feature in, in WebEx. All right. I, I need kind of like a lukewarm gesture. I think there's a reasonable argument for parallelizing this with signal. Berta, you mean by parallelizing, you mean making it analogous uh, and having analogous features to to signal? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so Richard, is there any is there a harm to the protocol for including it? There's not. Um, like I said, it's a, it's fairly cleanly separable, which means it doesn't make it more um, doesn't really make much difference one way or the other whether it's in the main protocol document. Um, I think the 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 concern some folks might have is like if you want to say this stack implements RFC whatever, um, and if folks weren't interested in implementing, you know, this 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 would expand the set of stuff you have to do to say I implement RFC whatever. Um, and you know, if not many people care about that that part of RFC whatever, then um, it might be a barrier to people implementing. Uh, just, uh, just asking, but, um, it's really like not, it's not adding a lot of complexity here, right? It's really just an app and a proposal. You send it out, you get it. Maybe there's some change in the UX, but there's nothing like crypto wise, almost nothing's changing. Right. So that's true. It, yeah. It's okay. So it doesn't really add a lot of complexity in my opinion. Um, that's Sam, I don't have strong feelings though, so I can't really help with that. Uh, it right, makes so, sense as a feature to me. Yeah. So I feel like the general feeling we're getting from folks here on the call is that they're the folks want to keep it. Um, I, I think that's coherent with some, some discussion we'd had on the mailing list earlier. So I think I might propose we close this because I think Brendan, I think, was the only one who'd expressed a strong desire to, to remove it. Um, Sean, as chair, do you want to make a, a call on that? I mean, that's basically what it sounds like. Nobody's nobody's screaming for it. Nobody's screaming against it. Um, I think, and at the end of the day, if we do end up having to like, if we do like, oh, that like find a problem and want to rip it out, we can basically do that, right? And it won't affect the core protocol. So I have a feeling that we just leave it. Okay, and that means we'll close this PR. So I think you yeah. can, should probably go ahead and close the PR on the call. All right. Okay. That was one I was one of the ones I was thought was gonna be more controversial. So good, we can cruise on. Um All right. okay. Okay, next one, 476. Ah, 476. So Conrad put this together. Conrad, do you want to introduce this one? Conrad is on the call. Not sure he has audio. Um, in any case, the, the, the uh, thing Conrad observed here is that um, there's, you know, we talk me? about, Hello? oh, yeah, there you go. Go ahead, Cameron. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So the idea is to have um, a different way of addressing members of a group uh, other than uh, leaf indices. And um, I mean, it, it, it does a couple of things, I think, but um, the core thing is that until now we only had the identity field and there was a discussion if uh, the identity uh, in a credential or should be unique in a group so that, um, yeah, in, in each key package and each leaf, um, that identity would have to be, there would have to be no other uh, leaf with the same identity. And um, this creates some problems as, as Richard pointed out. Um, for example, in the case where you have certificates, 
and um, the certificate has an identity and you want to and the identity corresponds to the user rather than the device. Um, and then you have one of multiple devices, but you don't get, to have to get more credentials uh, for all those devices, but you only have that user level credential. And um, so what you can do is you can have an endpoint ID, but that endpoint ID doesn't live in the uh, credential, but rather in the key package. So that it's kind of um, immediately um, delegated or signed by the credential. So you can think of it as a, uh, as the, the credential um, yeah, certifying the, the endpoint ID there. And the tuple of identity and endpoint ID then should be unique per group. And um, yeah, this gives us a new way of um, addressing members of a group in a group. And I think that's about it. Well, thanks. And I, I would add that um, th this PR made a lot of sense because when we implemented in WebEx, we actually had to add an extension that basically had this unique identifier for a client anyway. So this, I think this clarifies the semantics of the protocol. Um, in terms of what we want to have, this kind of invariance we want to assure on updates um, and kind of uniqueness guarantees we want. Um, so I, I think this is a, a, seems like a clear change to me. I'm inclined to, to just merge it. Uh, one more addition, um, and I forgot, I promised Richard to file an issue for this, but I forgot, so I'll just say it now. This would also allow us to get rid of the um, uh, leaf indices <laughs> in the message formats. So we could, instead of kind of being having these leaf indices that are fixed to this error representation of the binary tree, we could just have identity, the identity endpoint tuple. And uh, Richard pointed out, this is a bit more noisy, right? You have to, it's a bit, the field is going to be larger than just a UN32, um, but it has the benefit of allowing us to abstract away, uh, well, or not completely, I guess, in the protocol, but at least from the wire standpoint, it abstracts away the representation of the binary tree, which I think is quite nice. But I'll I'll find a proper issue for that now. It, it would certainly get us away from a specific way of storing or thinking about the tree. It would make it more amenable to different tree representations. So uh, yeah, unless folks have um, further thoughts or concerns about this, I'm inclined to just merge this one. See a thumbs I, up from um, Rowan. I, I did have some thoughts. First of all, I'd like to preface by saying, in principle, I'm for this PR. So uh, this, these thoughts are mainly me trying to poke holes in my own opinion, and I wanted mm -hmm. to uh, share it with you guys. Um, so my first thought of how to do multiple devices on an account would be to add an extra X509 cert, right, between the identity one and then. So I was trying to compare that against this solution. And one thing that it, it struck me as, with this solution, if you if you distinguish between different devices on an account, if I ever get the identity key, there's kind of no other key material that's device specific that I can deprovision somehow. I don't know if that's. Oh, so let me make sure that uh, we're we understand we're talking about the same thing here. So I think Conrad mentioned the concern I had about um, certificates. The concern was not sharing key pairs. You would still have device specific key pairs. Okay. The, the challenge is that the identities that you talk about in certificates tend to be kind of the public identities. So in WebEx, we issue emails to address certificates. And so if I join from two devices, if I join a WebEx meeting from two devices, I would have two email, two certificates with the same email address in them. So they wouldn't be distinct at that kind of credential certificate level identity level, but they would, you know, if you wanted to talk about them as the distinct identity, you need to have a device identity as well, a device identifier. And so that, that's what this PR is adding, is that extra extra, just extra identifier. So the keys are, are different. Um, I think we should, uh, I forget if we have, or I think this has a requirement for different signature keys as well. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, we, I think have... we added that a while back. Um, yeah, I think we should definitely so we, keep we that. the distinction of signature keys anyway. Yeah, so this is really just about having okay. unique identifiers. Um, I think, I, I think I just, I, did, I didn't say clearly, uh, I did, I've said basically I didn't say what I wanted to say. So let me try one more time. Um, I think the point is, if we do things this way, then let's say now I'm a device and I wanna update my signing key in a given session. Essentially, I need the identity signing key to do that, right? Because that's the only cert, is that, is that right? Or can I, 
can I still roll over to a new signing key without? You you can roll over um, because I think the spec is sufficiently vague for that. Uh, in the but, sense that the, the AS needs to be able to authenticate your new key when you use it to you know sign an update or whatever message you're going to send. But I think that's yeah. literally the only requirement. Yeah, the, the, the signature key is only carried in the credential in any case, and that's not changed by this at all. So if you can get a new authenticated key that you put in a credential, then um, then you can continue that, then you can you know, continue as before. There's no change with this PR. But I would need a new signature at my leaf, right? Of my key package at my leaf. And this, the key with which I produced that signature is the one that's in the cert. Is that right? Or am I mis maybe I'm just misremembering something. I mean, you would need um, a new. Yeah, you, you don't, um, it doesn't really matter in that sense. The, the only requirement here is that the key can be authenticated by everyone. Yeah. Okay. I think, so, I think, let me just say it this way. I just want to make sure that this doesn't incentivize implementations to to keep the root level identity signing key around on devices because they need it to do updates inside a session. That was the one issue that I wasn't quite clear on. If this if this approach to distinguish between devices on an account incentivizes that type of implementation. If not, then anyway, I don't have any any issue. I think you can still have whatever um, key structure you want on top of this. So you can have an, a user level or a, a kind of high level identity key that signs the individual uh, device keys, signature keys, and then you can go even further and then have group specific okay, keys. Yeah, yeah. So that should be possible. All right, cool. Then, uh, I mean, uh, that was the only concern because I think it's it's useful to try and make these identity keys as used as rarely as possible so people don't have them lying around so that you can actually deprovision, deprovision devices and it's meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. It's also something you can comment on concern. in the architecture document if you'd like. Uh, we already have a comment on that about the keeping the signature keys as far as different uses and uh, delegation, but if you are concerned about the lifespan and the device, that's something that could be mentioned there because it's a non-normative document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, Joel. Um, anyone else have com comments, concerns here? All right, and I think we're clear to merge. Do you want me to do that, or you want to press? Do you want to press the button, or are you going to go through those later? I'll, I'll go through these uh, after the meeting and, and pull the trigger on all okay. of them, just in I'm, case I'm there's any like conf any conflicts or anything, and I can resolve yeah, these that time. Yeah, I uh, just put notes in there. All right, so we'll go to the next one. Four seventy seven, I think, is the next one. Yeah, so this just adds a flag to the um, I think it's the MLS plain text struct that indicates whether you know, when you have an MLS plain text, you might send it as MLS plain text, or you might send it as MLS ciphertext after you encrypt it. Um, and that impacts a couple things, um, like in particular, whether you need to um, provide a, a membership proof uh, in that membership tag. Um, it, it's also handy to have this um, tag on the outside at the top of MLS plain text and MLS ciphertext to indicate whether this is in fact an MLS plain text or ciphertext message um, can be useful for the DS in some cases. Um, so yeah, this this just adds that field and and says how it's um, how it's populated. Um, yes, to repeat my, my message. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to repeat uh, what I wrote there essentially is. This is also helping on the client side if you don't necessarily know you got a message and you don't really know if it's a ciphertext or a uh, plain text from whatever group configuration you have. Um, 
then it helps you kind of know what to uh, parse essentially. Otherwise you have to either know what the configuration is or you just guess uh, this is a plain text or this is a ciphertext and that's not, not a good situation, I think. And looking at the description here, another nice kind of cryptographic property is that because we now signal this, um, you get a group agreement on this that so that everyone knows that they got us. Everyone either got the message as an encrypted message, or as a plain text message, and you, know, it's, you can't have this differences in that among the group, which is fairly minor property, but kind of nice. So, um, last call for objections, or, or we'll merge it. So from the uh, the metadata perspective, I think this doesn't add any new metadata that uh, we you know we couldn't have extracted before. It just makes it more explicit in that sense. So yeah, from the privacy right. perspective, this is not a concern. Going once, going twice, sold. See, four seventy eight is next. So this is pretty far down in the cryptographic weeds, but um, HPKE has two slots where you can uh, inject associated data. Uh, one is they call info, and one is uh, the AAD. Um, this move, so we had been injecting group context in at the AAD stage, um, and this just moves it up into that info slot. And what that means is, is that it gets injected earlier into the key derivation instead of as AAD on the uh, AAD operation. Um, I forget who suggested this. I think it may have been Conrad, um, actually, who filed the issue. Issue was from Conrad and uh, says for Franciscus and Raphael. So I don't know. Kind of, uh, like this one. Yeah, it's it's always nice to have the guarantees set in the keys rather than in the encryption process. So fairly minor change, but could have um, you know give it some useful rigidity. Um, all right. Well, since the cryptographer or one of the cryptographers in the room is actually suggesting it, I feel. Uh, confident that we can pull this off. So let's go ahead and just get it merged. Um, also to note that um, please go ahead and uh, figure out a way to get your name added to the, or send it to me in um, that I put in the group chat or send it to me in uh, email so I can add you. All right, so this one is gonna be um, discussed at, Mm -hmm. Right. And I think next is four seven nine. Well, maybe just for context here, <clears throat> I filed this issue 473. And on the PR side, uh, there are really two PRs that uh, address that. So it's 479 um, and also 480. So they sort of work in conjunction. Correct, yeah. Yeah, we, have, we have a couple of extensibilities here, uh, PRs here. Yeah, so so this PR, uh, and uh, thanks to Raphael and Conrad for, um, Raphael and team for uh, raising this ambiguity. I think that this um, clarifies a bunch of operations around how extensions get processed. Um, so I think what we added here, yeah, I think there's basically two major changes here. Um, 
if you flip over um, to the PR, um, the first major change is at um, line 2828, uh, screw, if you scroll down a bit, um, where we, uh, a bit further, looking for, uh, yep, keep going. Toward the bottom. I don't know, I've got to figure, explain this in reverse order. Um, yeah, so the third one up, right, right at the top of the, where you've got now. So what we've done is we've split this extensions field in the welcome into two different fields. Um, one, the first field is group context extensions, which are logically the extensions for the group, the ones that you put in the group context object. Um, and so that's that tell you know that that field you know the uh, the the joiner has a clear instructions to what to do with those extensions. Um, the other extensions field is any other extensions that this welcome message is just being used to carry. The obvious uh, example of that is um, the tree the ratchet tree extension where uh, the you can use that extension to you know put the tree in the welcome message, but the um, the recipient of the welcome message, the joiner, just uses that to populate the tree in their group state. They don't do anything with it beyond that. Um, they they don't keep, say keep it around in the group extensions, uh, in group context extensions. So we've kind of separated out those two use cases for um, for extensions in the welcome message, uh, and those instructions are, are made clear a bit further down here. Um, the second major change here is, uh, if you scroll back up to the group context extensions proposal, um, basically this allows those group context extensions, the, the extensions for the group that are uh, in that group context object, this allows someone to uh, update those. Um, and to keep things simple, we just provide a new list of extensions um, there's not like some merge algorithm here. You just replace the group context extensions on the group with this thing, whatever is in this proposal. Um, that's probably the most, you know, possibly controversial thing here because now we have, we're allowing group members to update the extensions, which, you know, you may have policy around. Um, in principle, you could get some complexity around this, but um, at this base level, I think uh, it can be pretty simple. So that, that's the overview of this PR and the proposed change. And clarif clarifying what the group context, what the extensions in the welcome mean, and then allowing the group context extensions to be updatable. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Because otherwise we'll merge this. Could you give maybe one or two examples of both types of uh, uh, extensions to help, I mean, just get intuition for the difference? Sure, yeah. So. Um, I have one example of, so, you know, we have two types of extensions in, you know, two buckets of extensions in the welcome. We have the group context extensions and other extensions. Um, so the other extensions bucket, I talked about a moment ago with the, the tree extension, where you get some extra information to help initialize your group, and then you throw that information away. It doesn't stick around. Uh, group context extensions are things that will you will store as extensions on the group context. Um, so a, a possible example there would be, um, you know, if we had a required extensions extension, as Rowan has proposed, um, it says these are the extensions that are required for this group. Um, you could have that in the um, group context extensions, and that would get you know, copied over into the group context so that everyone in the group agrees on it so that you know that everyone will apply the, the same requirements for the required extensions. Um, likewise, if you had, you know, kind of required pro proposal types or things like that. Okay, cool. So an example maybe of, a, of the not group context, so the other extensions would be something like, hey, you have to use this PSK or? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, PSKs are handled, have their own special mechanism, but um, maybe if there were some general PSK behavior you wanted to signal in an extension, you would use that, um, you know, to, to kind of signal a different behavior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. 
I think another way to think about it maybe is that the group context extensions are things that the whole group is guaranteed to agree on. The other extensions are kind of throwaway. They're ephemeral. They're only between the committer or the sender of the welcome and the joiner. Should we hold off on giving the thumbs up on this one till we re do till we review 480? Um, could do. I don't think they're super conjoined, but okay. Because my, my I was gonna go. I was gonna go questions about like. So now that we have different types of extensions, we have to provide instructions for registering those extensions and you know saying whether they're one type or another, et cetera. If right? if you it's scroll to the bottom. You can see that we've there. updated the IANA, the IANA consideration. So there's a column in the registry that says which of these fields the uh, extension can appear in. Cool. All right. Um, let's just do the other ones. They're both kind of connected. We can do that when we always come back. Okay. So maybe just to add to that, Richard, uh, the, the last thing you said in my mind is the most important one. So <clears throat> you really have to think whether you want a group agreement or not on an extension. And so as far as examples go, there are probably not too many for that, but it gives you a really high assurance that the whole group sees the same thing. Whereas the other bucket of extensions, um, it's essentially to use the MLS group as, a, as an end-to-end -end encrypted pipe um, in that sense, especially regarding the, the welcome message and later on um, by having custom proposals. But it's not necessarily something that you always want the whole group to agree on because that content, as you said, could be ephemeral or it could change over time. All right, so you got 480 here. Yeah, so, so Joel pointed out to me that um, we had in principle extensible proposals, but there were a couple of things we could do to kind of smooth this out. So all this really does is um, it adds uh, a proposals bucket to the capabilities object that clients are required to send to say which non-default proposals um, a client supports. And then we extend the IANA registry so that um, we get proposal types registered um, including a reservation for private use, so that you know if you want to do something creative with this in your in your implement in your application or your product, um, you can do something uh, in this vendor space without having to have a registered uh, proposal ID. So, pretty small changes here. And just to go back to types of extensions, the capability extension that we have extended here um, is uh, a key package extension, which is not affected by 479, um, but you know, it's, it's specified in the IANA registry as to be uh, one thing, uh, an extension that only appears in key packages. I strongly, I, I really like the key package extension. I think it's very, very useful. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to be merging these two. Um, and given what, what Britta is saying in chat and what Joel uh, pointed out, I think I will take a look at 479 and maybe add some, um, some more context about when you use which types of extensions. But uh, after that, I think we'll, we'll be clear to merge. Yeah. So we uh, get to go in 480 as well, Sean? Yep. Fantastic. Roll right through this. OK, 481 is one of the interesting ones. Um, so this is due to an issue that Britta filed, um, which I think capture is a good and interesting case, but I think ultimately doesn't um, quite call for um, 
a big change. Um, so, Britta, I'll try and paraphrase this, but feel free to um, uh, amend my description if uh, if I get it wrong. Um, let's see which, which issues is that four four three. Um, so, I think the question here is one of of recovery. Um, and so it's kind of recovery robustness versus um, robustness against uh, partial compromise. Um, so for practical reasons, you know, clients lose state sometimes and they, we want to allow them to um, resync their state and uh, you know, recover the state they've lost for the group as long as they have some state around. Um, the mirror image of that, though, is that whatever... Uh, the minimum set of state is that we allow for someone to resync um, is also this minimum set of state that an attacker needs to compromise in order to uh, resync themselves in. Um, so we had sketched in a resync mechanism based on external commit, um, where as long as the uh, the resyncing members uh, members client had the signature key they went with that leaf, uh, they could um, they could resync and recover the, the rest of the group state. Now, um, Britta notes here that um, there, that kind of mirror image property, if we have that sort of resync, then if only the signature keys for the group are compromised, then, and, and not any of the kind of symmetric group state that has been built up um, over the course of the group, then the attacker can do this resync operation as well um, recover all of the um, uh, other uh, state that that the the member the victim member had, and then uh, you know part of this resync operation is to evict the old representation of the member, and so the, the attacker as part of this abuse of this mechanism would end up evicting the old legitimate uh, instance of the member. So. Um, I think the, the initial proposal here was to um, include a PSK. So some of that um, symmetric state that had built up you know, that would demonstrate that the member had been around in a prior epoch. Um, as I was chalking this through a bit with Conrad, um, I think Conrad noticed that this causes some practical issues because if in between when you've lost your state, um, you know, lost some state, and when you come back, some folks have been added, they won't have the PSK uh, that you need to, you know, that you're using to demonstrate your prior membership. So there's that practical issue. I'm also not sure that this is super intimately tied to the resync with external commit um, pattern either, because if you, if you allow external commit at all, then someone can join and then remove the old instance. So the, the fact that we, we allow remove to be done in the same uh, commit as, as the join um, isn't really substantive because you can do it separately after anyway. So I think what this led to in the PR was, um, you know, I initially wrote the PR up with this PA, PSK um, solution in it, but I, I, I then backed that off so that it's um, a more cons kind of constrained, it, it still provides some cleanup. Uh, around how you do this resync and what is allowed to be in an external commit, but it doesn't have that PSK facility in it. So Britta, I don't know if you had any, any corrections on that, any amendments, but I think that's kind of where, where I ended up on this. That's a pretty good summary. Uh, I would add a couple points. One is about the immediate reject. So there is a value to a, shall we say like a time period between when you have the external commit coming in or the external join and then removing the current copy of Alice, for example. Uh, namely that if the attacker is coming in as this external member and you actually have an attack going on versus a valid Alice removing an old copy of herself, then the current Alice can see that there's a duplicate of herself uh, entering the group and has actually a chance to uh, not necessarily flag the group, but uh, see what's going on versus just being kicked out and thinking, well, what happened, so to speak? So basically that you're giving this a, a time period to actually see that there's a, that everyone can see that there was a duplicate of Alice at some point and either if they want to confirm out band or whatever by other mechanisms that that was uh, indeed intended. 
-hmm. so there is a consideration to not having simply an immediate add and uh, eject as a simultaneous action. Well, so I, I, I would observe that, you know, computers are fast and um, there's nothing cryptographically stopping someone from, um, you know, doing an external join and immediately send after that they're I mean, immediately after someone does an external join, they're a member of the group and could immediate in principle immediately send a remove. But I think to your point, if they are required to be separate protocol operations, then in principle, like the DS could apply some cooling off policy and say after someone uh, does an external join, then maybe they can't immediately, you know, the DS could enforce a cooling off and say you can't immediately send that remove. Precisely. Yeah, okay. So there's value to kind of having a separate protocol. For I think that makes sense. Another comment about the PSK. So uh, with this, as far as there, there is that a slight what if scenario that you brought up of that, if someone adds during the time that Alice has been offline, she wants to resync, um, then they won't recognize that the PSK is valid. And this is a bit of a niche possible scenario, but it, it could happen. I acknowledge that. In that case, we could actually be tying that PSK as it should be to a certain epoch. We do have the epoch IDs. And so someone who is a new joiner could simply see that this uh, PSK came in before uh, they uh, were part of the group and it would have to be shared uh, with anyone who's new, either by Alice or by the other group members. And the fact that other group members uh, are, can process on that, uh, that who were there at the time of that PSK uh, generation is essentially vouching for it. Uh, I think the bigger concern about this uh, from the sync of about this general PR actually isn't so much tied to the particular attack scenario that is on the screen now, uh, as much as that the resync option was very carefully fleshed out uh, earlier in the PR, and then that was removed and not and decided that we didn't need that by the working group. And so that was the far earlier PR by Conrad and I. And this one, uh, so my concern is that it's a little bit, uh, it might be shortcutting some of the issues that were actually addressed with trying to resync uh, in a way that is most secure. So yeah. I would say actually the, the bigger concern with this PR is that all the previous, everything from the previous version is deconflicted with it and seeing why, what the effects are uh, before jumping on a resync solution. Yeah. And so I think where all of that points out, if I could make a kind of proposal for what to do here. I, I think your, your point about separating the protocol operations is, I, I can see some salience to that. I think where that points is to just forbidding uh, remove proposals um, in this so that, that we, we have an enforced separation between uh, external commit and any removes initiated by the, the joiner. So, I mean, it, in the PR, we distinguish between the uh, commits by value and the commits by reference because the commits by reference can only be produced by current members of the group, commits by value are uh, produced by the joiner. So I think the way I would uh, update the PR to address some of these comments would be to just remove the possibility for any of those commits by value commits from the joiner, uh, forbid those to be remove uh, proposals. And so that you would have to have that separation between the protocol operations. I mean, so you could still do this resync if the DS would let you do a join and then remove your old self. Um, but as you say, it would, it would give the opportunity for a DS that's concerned about this sort of attack to enforce a cooling off period. So we, we'd basically be removing resync and reducing it to external join followed by uh, a remove, which we have confidence around those both individually. Um, and I think that would kind of address some of the um, analysis uh, worries. Does that make sense to you, Rita? Yeah, I think if it can be reduced to the things that we are already utilizing, then that would certainly simplify the analysis versus a whole new uh, kind of side way into the protocol. Yeah. So there's a part that I still don't understand when you use the external commits to resync 
Uh, since we mandate that we have uh, distinct signature keys, how do you resync if you've lost all states and the only thing you have left is the, the old signature key? So that's a good question. I think, yeah, given that we mandate new signature, key, uh, distinct signature keys, you could, if we have, if, unless we have a unitary join and remove earlier appearance, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do resync uh, with the proposed mechanism. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's maybe a challenge here. Well, I think there's a somewhat easy way around that. That, and this was brought up by the working group. I forget who uh, said it and why it was addressed. Why resync was originally removed uh, from the protocol when proposed uh, earlier on, and that's at some point you're basically adding in a new member. You know, there is a value to resync if if it can be done quickly and the member has necessary information, uh, but if they don't, then at some point it's basically adding in a new member. So I actually think that one way to think about it is that there's kind of a, a cost benefit around this this separated um, join, you know, external join followed by remove style of resync. Um, the benefit is that there's no dependency on having um, passed, um, you know, having still having your signature key around. So as long as you can get a credential, you can get an authenticated signature key for your identity. You can join and uh, evict your old self. Um, the downside is, as, as Raphael points out, that you have to get a new signature key and a new credential in order to um, do resync this way. Which which is a limitation. I mean, we might run into similar challenges with. Um, the device IDs uh, from the earlier PR, um, right? Because if this is the same logical device uh, as the rest of the system regards it, then um, it, you might want to have the same device ID in, in the key in the key package. Oh, yeah, that's that. another good point because that has to be unique as well. So this might also be linked to losing state in the first place, right? That if, a, if the device has lost state and has also lost, uh, because the argument was made that maybe it doesn't even remember the prior uh, PSK, then it, is it such a major cost benefit to differential to regenerate or to generate these things uh, per new, the fact that it's already uh, lost so much? Use that case. Uh, so common? That, that's an open question that someone's working more on implementation can answer. I mean, I guess this is very speculative in the sense that you don't know exactly what's going to break. What's the most likely to break is that some of the bits in your you know, persistent memory are going to flip. And not your whole device disappears, um, but mm -hmm. you end up receiving messages in a group that you cannot decrypt for whatever reason. And typically yes. that's when engineers try and devise ways to minimize the, the UX impact for users at that point in time, assuming the rest still works. If everything else is gone, like the whole client, the whole database, then anyway, this is probably not an MLS problem anymore. But I think this is most likely to matter in the context where you receive messages you cannot decrypt and you assume that you need to resync because there's nothing else you could assume at that point. It's interesting you say that because to me, I was thinking the most common use case would be people lose their device or their credentials and they basically have to re, they have to, you know, 
they, they add a new device to their account that has a blank state and are now trying to join in all their old groups again. That was, that was the scenario I had in mind here. That happens all the time for us. <laughs> no, agreed. That's a valid scenario, but that's not a resync by definition in that sense, because it is effectively a new device in that sense, right? That's that's certainly how I had the taxonomy I had in mind that you know a, a new device completely uninitialized is a new device and not a resync. Resync is where you still have some chunk of state left. there's some chunk of state left, then we should be assuming that they have a PSK from one of the prior epochs. The signature key isn't part of the group state. Um, so when we talk about uh, PSKs from previous epochs, do we literally mean the resumption secrets, which are currently used for something slightly different? Or is it something completely proprietary in that sense? I think that's an open question. I think we had a way of deriving a PSK from a prior epoch, but I need to refresh my memory on what it was. There originally was yeah. a resumption, uh, a yeah. resync secret that was separate from the other, from the resumption secret, but that was removed from the PR uh, by agreement of the working group. Yeah. So let me propose this way forward. Um, I think the, the high certainty path is, is as Britta points out, to remove the ability to do uh, a resync with um, a, a single uh, operation. Um, so I might propose tweaking number, uh, the, the PR we're, we're discussing here, uh, which is, forgetting which PR we're on here. Um, PR number 481, um, update that to forbid remove proposals uh, initiated by the joiner. Um, and then I will take an action to review the discussion uh, around the earlier recent proposal and try and figure out why we didn't do that um, and refresh that. Um, because otherwise we basically end up without resync, um, which seems like a pretty salient gap. I think that's a that's good proposal it. because I personally don't remember either why this other PR was closed at all, what the problem yeah. was with it. And it sounds like it- yeah, I think nobody does. <laughs> so, okay, so I will- uh, Yeah. About your, your, your uh, select, uh, suggested resolution here um, or way forward. Would it make sense instead of saying that the um, resync device uh, is not allowed to remove people for a certain amount of time, instead to say that the can, the old device cannot be removed by anyone because that way, if they're you know if the adversary controls two accounts, then what you're proposing doesn't stop them from immediately re removing. Well, to be clear, I wasn't going to specify a cooling off period because you may or may not want that as in an application. Um, if, if, if you wanted to use this for resync, you wouldn't uh, want that cooling off period. Um, what I was going to propose is, what I was going to implement is, is um, well, what I was going to remove was the ability to do a remove in the same protocol operation as an external join. So you would have to do an external join, and then once you're a member, send a remove. Um, which provides the opportunity for a, a concerned DS to apply that cooling off period. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I don't have a better solution, but it, I'm a slightly uneasy about codifying into the core spec. What we're essentially doing is puncturing some of the E2E or, you know, guarantees or and, and it's there's a trade off that has to be made to, to support resync. I mean, that's what you started with. I just, I don't know. I just, for the record, it's, I'm slightly uneasy about codifying that. Yeah. Extensions can, can help it. If, if, if one wants a deployment without uh, that, that, that trade off, then one can use an extension to change it. 
Um, so I guess I'm okay. All right, well, I, I will report on that within hopefully 24 or 48 hours here. Um, so please keep an eye on the mailing list for uh, some further thoughts on what to do with this and hopefully we can close this down um, you know, this week or so. Trying to keep the, the battle tempo up, as they say. Um, all right, so I think we're good on, we have path forward on uh, 481. Uh, next, yes. I think, yeah. 43. 43. This is, um, we'd had uh, open issues and to-dos noted, noted in the documents. Um, and so this just goes through and removes them. <laughs> um, actually, I so there's one bit of proposed text in there that um, is just listed in comments. I need to update the PR to do that. But let's just assume that's going to happen. Conrad, did you want to say anything about the, the lifetime stuff here? Um, no, I think. I mean, I think um, Britta, together with Cass, we, we found these open issues. Okay, if you could take a look as well. Um, but yeah, I discussed with Richard and uh, the comments should reflect what I thought was, was our thinking back then. But um, yeah, please take a look. And then there was the open issue um, on the PS case, Richard, if you remember. Right. So yeah, I think the the open open issue we have here is around. Um, yeah, Sean, if you could switch over to the files and search for NKDF. Um, that Conrad, I don't think we came to a resolution on. Um, no, and I promised to research on the NKDF thing, and I can say a little bit about it if you want. Yeah, please. Okay, so the problem here is um, there might be a situation where you want to inject more than one PSK in a given epoch into the key schedule. And uh, what we kind of have as a cryptographic assumption, de facto because it's used in TLS, is that if you do HKDF on two uh, secret keys, then the result is good is if, sorry, the result is good if uh, either of the two input keys is good. But what we don't have is this is for, uh, what we don't have is the same thing for n keys. So this is not commonly used as a as a as an assumption, and um, it's not clear that this is actually that that this gives you a, a key. Of course, we could assume it, and in the random oracle model, it will work. But um, yeah, we're trying to steer clear of that. Um, so <clears throat> one alternative to just chucking n PSKs essentially into a KDF. Granted, the the um, process right now in the spec is a bit more refined with uh, proper labels and, and, and a counter and stuff. But um, the problem remains, and there is uh, this NPRF uh, or NKDF proposal by Chris Proska, which was discussed in the past as a kind of replacement mechanism for the whole key schedule. But this was rejected, I think, um, kind of on, a, on the argument of being conservative and following the TS, TLS style key schedule approach um, kind of just to be safe because that's been well understood and well researched and the NKDF stuff is a bit more, a bit newer, albeit like, it's not like there is no black magic going on there. Um, but there might be, a uh, an argument for using the NKDF approach in, in the case of the PS case. And, um, what is the NKDF approach? It's essentially using all the input keys, um, and, uh, well, HKDFing them or hashing them together with a counter, or if you want, with a counter and a name for each of the input keys, um, and then <clears throat> storing the result, and then again having an, uh, having an extract expand cycle on the results with some more labels and some more context put in. So this is a gross simplification. I can post something in the chat. This is a, a link to. Um, to this written up formally by Chris and Jan. So yeah, please take a look there. So this would be the proposal to do the PSK thing. If we're okay with a random Oracle model-based approach, just for the PSK is essentially saying, well, this is, it's not the, 
main key schedule. So it's okay to compromise here, then that would be that. The alternative would be like taking advantage of this relatively new mechanism that has seen not a lot of analysis, uh, but is promised to work for multiple PSKs. I think either way we have an algorithm um, that has um, has some some level of analysis. You know, we have an algorithm in there that has, um, I think, probably even less analysis than the, the uh, NKDF approach. Um, although I, I guess part of I think part of how we got I think to the current algorithm was that that's the TLS working group is doing some stuff about combining multiple um, not PSKs but multiple. Um, key agreement um, like DH outputs um, for uh, hybrid uh, hybridization of classical and post quantum cryptography. Um, and I think that's where we got this. Sean, does that ring a bell to you? Having seen the TLS stuff, Sean is nodding. Um, yeah, either way, we have a mechanism here that has some level analysis. Um, maybe the way forward here is to, you know, Keep the PR as it is, remove the open issue, but go ahead and file an issue to track this, file a GitHub issue to track this NKDF stuff. I have a question for implementers about this proposal. Mm -hmm. um, so comparing the two constructions, the one we have right now and this NKDF, NKDF calls for an XOR of the secrets, right? The one, the construction we have right now, I think you could probably, you could implement that given an implementation with a, like a library with a standard API into HKDF, maybe, with extract and expand. I think you could implement the current construction without ever having to do anything more than just call these KDFs right mm -hmm. through the API. Whereas with the XOR, now somehow you have to be able to do that on the secrets. Is that an issue given, say, let's say you're trying to use, you know, OpenSSL or something under the hood as your core crypto library? Do you now have to extract the secret, do the XOR, and put it back in the library? Can you do that in the library? Is there no difference? I think that you could, you know, you could be more serious issues here um, if you were like trying to work in some side inside some crypto envelope, like for those validation purposes. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I'm just not clear just... on whether it makes any difference for implementation or not. That's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head whether you know the sort of things that have those boundaries that would make it difficult to extract things and XOR it yourself, whether those things also have, you know, where you can do an XOR inside the boundary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an easy operation to do in constant time, at least. Of course, yeah. We had an NSA rep on the call. I didn't, don't know if uh, she has thoughts here. <laughs> so, um, how much. Um... How many implementers are actually planning to go and do stuff with multiple PSKs? Um, I don't think we have, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was thinking that, I mean, this is something that might actually happen, I think. Yeah, I, like I don't think any of the implementations have done any PSK work yet, but I think if I were gonna do, if I were gonna implement and say, uh, in the stack I work on, um, I would go ahead and do the fully general thing uh, as opposed to trying to do any special pleading for um, uh, that would handle like a single PSK. And the protocol is structured to send multiples, so um, you can't really say you're supporting PSKs unless you support multiple. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm asking, is this something that we can punt to another spec? Well, we need to deal with the possibility of having multiple PSKs if we have a PSK proposal. So you, otherwise, well, we could just say you cannot do, it's illegal to have two PSKs or more than two PSKs in, a, in an epoch, but. Um. So Conrad, yeah. how would you feel if it was um, that the def that it's currently undefined if you have multiple PSKs in an, in an epoch? And um, and that that could be something for future extension. And another way to think about that is that you know, for example, um, you know, TLS right now or TLS 
always has only ever had a single PSK input. Um, there's a negotiation around how you pick, pick that PSK, but it's it's ultimately just a single PSK. Um, and I think that there's been some work done to um, ex kind of extend before that so that you might choose multiple things and then produce a single value. Um, I wish Jonathan Hoyland were on the call to comment on that because I think he's been leading some of that. But um, I, I think it's a fair point that if we had a single PSK input, then you could ha maybe have an extension that says how you uh, put it, pull in multiple PSKs. Um, that might complicate the welcome message a little bit as I think about it, but um, yeah, you could potentially have some extensions that you know, provide, you know, that, that address this multiplicity that say multiple PSKs go into that, what is ultimately one PSK slot in the key schedule. And that would punt this whole discussion. Uh, if I could propose like an alternative solution um, that would kind of allow us to uh, loop around this thing a bit. Since we have the, the um, assumption that allows us well, de facto, we have it in the key schedules the, to uh, combine two PSKs. We could just have a cascade of this, and that would be more expensive because you'd have a lot of HKDF calls. But it would be uh, it would only be HKDF calls, and it would still be uh, at least my hunch is that it would be provably secure. So that would be another alternative, and that of course gets expensive if you have a lot of PSKs. But since we kind of assume that we're not going to have a lot of PSKs in a given epoch, we should be okay. Yeah, I, I mean, the proposal... I think... Sorry, go ahead, John. The proposal was to just um, uh, do what we do now and repeat it for every PSK. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying, Condor? Uh, the proposal would be not to concatenate the the PSKs as we do there and to kind of chuck them into the into the KDF as a kind of big string, but instead take two at a time, uh, condense it down to essentially have a tree of of which kind of fits the overall topic of the protocol. So we'd have a kind of tree of uh, of PSKs where at each leaf you have a PSK and then you combine two PSKs, you get a new one and then. You combine the next two PSKs gotcha. and then you combine the results, et cetera. Or, or you just do them in a line, um, which I think is the same number of HKDF invocations. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I like the tree better. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's have another tree in the protocol. More ASCII art. So anyway, this, this feels like something we can point to another issue, another PR. Um, so Conrad, can you take the action to kind of propose, you know, file, file an issue and um, you know, make a proposal on how to resolve this? Sure. Um, I guess, so I, I got the feeling that the NKDF approach, people are kind of skeptical um, at this stage. So um, I, I'll write a PR for the um, cascading uh, HKDF thing then. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds the, like the safest option to me. I think the thing that's salient to me is is the point Joel mentioned about um, you know crypto context where you might have a boundary and needing to remove things out of the boundary to um, to do XORs. So yeah, the cascaded H HKDF thing seems like the thing that we have most conf confidence in being both secure and implementable. Sure, I'll do it. Okay. All right, so I think that was the only. Um, other thing in this PR that had any any controversy to it. So um, unless there are further thoughts, um, I will plan to add this additional paragraph to discuss PSK risks um, that Conrad and I discussed and, um, and go ahead and merge. All right, sounds good. So on to, I think, our last one, uh, 484, clarifying node versus leaf indices. Um, so we have, um, as Conrad mentioned a bit earlier, we have this tree. We need to refer to nodes in that tree. 
Sometimes we need to refer to a node, an internal node in that tree, and sometimes we only need to refer to a leaf. So, for example, when we want to refer to a um, the sender of uh, of a an MLS plain text um, by by signer index, we uh, need to refer to that only by the leaf. And so, um, we use basically two different sets of indices to refer to nodes and to refer to leaves. When we refer to leaves, we uh, only include the leaves of the tree in that uh, index. When we refer to nodes, we refer to every node in the tree. Now, the way we've specified this kind of array-based representation of the tree, um, the leaves are the even-numbered nodes and the uh, internal nodes are the odd-numbered ones. So there's a kind of straightforward relationship between those two. And in principle, you could get away with only ever using the um, the node indices, you would just have an extra zero when you want to talk about leaves. Um, the other, the risk of only ever using the node indices would be that um, when you have a slot that's only ever supposed to talk about a leaf, like the signer index, it's what you'd have a risk. You'd have to validate that slot when it came in and valid, verify that it was an even one that represents a leaf. Um, and so using separate indices makes it you know impossible to represent an, an invalid node in that sort of leaf only slot. Um, so we'd had some discussion about whether to remove the indices I, I, or, or consolidate on one set of indices, uh, use only the node indices. Um, I, I felt pretty strongly in that discussion that um, we should keep the two sets of indices because in practice, uh, we found an implementation that you could use you know, type systems and languages to keep them separate um, and indicate in the, the message structures which, which it should be. But it wasn't super clear in the spec. So the compromise we arrived at was to Clarify in the specification um, when we have an index that we refer to, whether it's a node index or a leaf index. So if you look at the changes in the PR, it's all, um, you know, we've basically annotated the structures to say when we have an index field, is this a node index or is it a leaf index? As basically a hint to implementers as to what type you should use there if you have a typed representation of this thing. If, if I may say something here. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the um, while this issue exists in the first place is because while implementing, we had a ton of uh, confusion kind of bugs where, where leaf indices and node indices were confused. And this might be due to our, I don't know, poor approach in terms of typing uh, the things, uh, but it kept coming back and it um, was very annoying. And part of the problem is that you, every, like, even if you have a leaf index, you um, you have to put it into functions. Oh, this is an implementation detail, I guess, but our experience is that you have functions that you need to process any kind of node, and then you put in a leaf index and they're gonna spit out a node index because they don't know what a leaf index is. And then you need to merge that back and such, et cetera. So maybe this is uh, uh, an implementation specific stuff, but this, uh, yeah, just to motivate it, this came back from our uh, experience of, uh, yeah, implementing. And, uh, and the bugs that arose. And in addition, I mean, if the point of leaf index is to only be addressing addressing leaves, then what happens when one of your leaves is blank? Um, I mean, it just seems like a silly like a silly extra thing to have. Um, and you know, we have in the in the explanation of in the ratchet tree explanation in the protocol document. Uh, we don't even bother to use the node indexes that we have in our in our in our little ASCII art, you know. Like, why 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 do we have these numbers if we're not going to use them? So that's a couple of uh, or two to one now in favor of only node indices versus keeping leaf indices. Any other thoughts here? All right. So I mean, if folks feel keen on this, um, I I can probably. Um, Learn to live. Learn to live with node indices only. Um, I think that will probably make me more inclined to adopt Conrad's proposal that 
um, in the places where we have leaf indices now, we um, swap that out for um, referring to things not by index, but by identity. Um, I think that will make that more compelling because again, you can only refer to things you know, by identity there. Um, and you can't refer to internal nodes. Um, but we can take that on as a, as a further action. Um, so I, I, can, I can rework this PR to uh, eliminate leaf indices instead of uh, just clarifying. Okay, and then this PR also sort of continues our inconsistent use of uh, of different forms of identifiers um, in our ASCII art. So in section five, we've got four different ways. We we have four different ASCII art trees, and each one uses a different, uh, you know uses a completely different convention for what the, how, how we label a, a non leaf node. <laughs> All right. I, I will take a pass through and try and make that more consistent. That that's that relates to your email uh, earlier, right? Ron. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I'm if, just, I'm just trying to make sure that we get all the things that were sent to the list and in GitHub all in the, the GitHub. So that's, that's all the reason, only reason why I asked. Yeah, I mean, if we were if we were going to just use like if we want to use a node ID to refer to nodes in the ASCII art, I'm great. You know, that's great for me. If we want to use something else, then we should be consistent in all in all the places where we have an ASCII art diagram. I, I will include that in the in the re revision of this PR. All right, so I think we have a way forward on that. Um, it is, uh, we have 25 minutes left, Sean, did you want to reserve some time to the architecture document? Sean, you're muted. Sorry. I was talking to myself, just checking to see if Benjamin's here. He's not, is there any one of the other authors here that want to speak for this? Um, I think the answer is no at that point. Um, and is there anything else that you think that we'll need to do in the protocol draft? I, I, e, will all the pull requests close out all the issues or are there new issues that have popped up? Um, I think almost all of the issues are addressed by current PRs. Um, there are a couple that just came up. Um, so there's, uh, the NKDF one we just discussed may just be it's a PR. Um, Rowan filed one a few hours ago. Um, about uh, ma mandatory extensions. Um, and then Conrad filed one about uh, identity and endpoint ID tuple uh, instead of leaf indices. Um, so I'll, I will make a proposal on that later this week um, after revising 484 to deal with the, the indices. So yeah, I think the only one um, that might merit from some discussion now is this mandatory extension types one. Um, we got time, so let's do Ro it. Rowan, you wanna kick that off? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, if we if we ever want the ability to have um, mandatory to implement extension, um, then now is the time to go and add that. And there are, as as Richard pointed out, there are many ways that you could uh, out of band that you could um, you could require. Um, a group to use what you, you know, a, a new mandatory extension. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, like a judgment call soft thing. Like you can, you can get, there's no requirement that you can't do. Um, but uh, if you want to include it in the protocol, it would be a more explicit way of signaling that this group needs to have these particular uh, these particular extensions. I don't have a super strong feeling about it, but it just seemed like seemed like something that would be useful to have. And then that this would be if we wanted to put it in, this would be one to do it. And if we explicitly decide that you know, we want to, we would rather have that be something out of the protocol, then I just think we need to put 
a paragraph in the in the protocol document saying that that's what we decided to do. How is this connected to the uh, group context extensions that get mixed into the key schedule and therefore we the cryptographic level enforces agreement on those extensions? I think so that's for, right. For any for any extension, the members of the group need to understand that they need to do something. And so if um if the if members of the group who who do not understand the extension and and just carry on the way they always have do not harm the interoperability of the group that's great um, where an extension needs to be understood by all the members of the group in order for the group to operate correctly um, there are two ways to handle those type of extensions how whatever wherever they appear um, whether they're a you know a cipher suite extension, a group, um, a uh, a group key extension, an extension extension, or a uh, uh, what's the what's our our third one? Um, no matter which type of extension it is, uh, the two ways of of enforcing that behavior would be to either have it in the protocol so that we have a way of telling other members of the group these things are required uh, to join this group and the other way to do that would be to have uh, the basically the delivery service um, some other external um, external you know service whether it be a centralized delivery service or whether it be some distributed protocol uh, to enforce that did that make sense Joel uh, so, <clears throat> kind of. Maybe I'm missing something, but um, in MLS, the negotiation of what extensions are mandatory for a group, uh, they first happen when somebody creates a group and that member single handedly decides what the minimum requirement is by picking um, key packages from potential new members. And, and looking at what capabilities they support. Um, and if they support the capabilities and extensions uh, that are required, they can be added to the group. If not, then they will not be added. Yes. Uh, and I think this is also signaled to new members as part of the welcome message. Uh, no, in no, fact, it is not. There, there's no signal, so, right? So, so Rafael, you're correct that the beginning of the group the creator can enforce those requirements, but there's not currently any way to reflect that in the group as it goes on to make sure that other clients apply the same constraints. Right, that's a good point, Jan. Yes, so, so to me, thinking about the enforcement points we have available, or the, the enforcement points, if your if your goal is to avoid a client that doesn't support um, the groups required, whatever extensions are required in this group, um, to never have a client that doesn't support those extensions added to the group, you have two enforcement points. You have the existing member's choice when they add someone based on their key package, and you have the external joiner's decision uh, when it sends an external commit based on the uh, a public group state, um, and so in uh, in both of those situations, you basically have an opportunity to advertise um, what the requirements are, and you don't need. I, I think you have an, a place to advertise that, like in the group context extensions, um, either you know the ones that are agreed on in the group uh, in the internal ad case or the ex group context extensions that are reflected in the public group state in the external case. Um, so I think that's the solution that seems appropriate here to me is to have kind of an extension that defines what is required for this particular group, uh, more of a dynamic framework than the, the kind of uh, extension ID based thing you've got here.
Yeah, I, I mean, could we use the the preparatory proposals for that to sort of communicate what the policy is around mandatory uh, extension? I mean, I, I think you you want everyone to agree on the policy, so I think that's it. it that's why it makes sense as a group context extension to me. Joel, do you have something? I missed you muted. Uh, yeah, I was trying to understand. Um, if the group context extensions are mixed into the key schedule, that is a way of already forcing everybody to agree on it, right? Right. Um, but we're, this is different what we're talking about now. So I, I'm trying to understand how this is different. Like, this is about making sure that people understand what extensions they need before they even join the group. Is that? Before they add point? anyone else into the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, this, so the, the mandated behavior would be that if this required extensions uh, thing is uh, in the, group context extensions, then a member who is generating an ad proposal must examine the key package it's adding to make sure that it has the required extensions. And uh, probably someone who's processing an ad proposal must examine it uh, to verify that it's compliant as well. Otherwise, the, the commit with the ad is un invalid. Right, so that's so basically you have the group together in force that no non-compliant client is ever added. So that sounds like then we have optional extensions if we need to have an extra list of saying which ones are mandatory. That means that well, we could be already have in... the extension is optional, right? Yeah, all extensions are optional right now. What Rowan is talking about is how you upgrade some of those to being mandatory for the group in a specific uh, group context. I think by by optional, I just meant that um, uh, some people in the group can use it while other people are not using it and that's okay for some proposals uh, sorry for some extensions is that is that the way it is right now correct okay okay yeah then then that makes a lot more sense to me yeah that that's cool that makes sense so having this dynamic list of these are the ones we single out as being mandatory Raphael, do you think that does that seem reasonable to you Um, by doing the the IANA extension stuff, or what is the proposed solution right now? What uh, what Richard proposed of having um, having a required extensions group group uh, group key an, an extension, extension an extension that you would put in the group context extensions, the semantic of which is these are the extensions that are required for the group. meta extension i'm not entirely sure um how that would work mechanically how do you distribute that to new members do you put that in the welcome as an it, extension or it, it's a group context extension so it gets distributed in the same way and since it's dynamic who gets to change it like, or how is it being changed? Application policy. <laughs> nice hand wave, Richard. <laughs> I would say that um, initially, if we just said that if this ex if this extension contains value, uh, that uh, it would just remain for the you know for the lifetime of the group. Um, that seems to me a fairly simple, simple way around this. And if someone wanted to later add an extension that says, this is the dynamic required extension, extension to group context extensions, then, then somebody could go and build that extension as a separate extension. I guess that's a reasonable approach. Um, there's definitely an element missing so far. So having something static to start with is probably good enough. So it sounds like the, the details here would benefit from having a PR for everyone to look at. Um, Rowan, do you want definitely. to take a stab at a PR or? 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think I yeah I'll, I'll shoot you a message privately to make sure that I understand the group context extension appropriately well. Yeah, I'm happy to help. Do we want to even make um, that an extension or just make that part of like every group rather than make it an extension? That's how I understood it, that it would not be an extension, but like a, a list of mandatory extensions. That could be empty, but it would still be there conceptually. Yeah. I mean, syntactically, you could do it either way, right? We have right now extensions that are we have required extensions in key packages, which in principle could just be part of the key package syntax, but they're uh, they're in an extension field now. Um, so I, I think that's something we can tinker with in the PR, whether we put it as in the syntactically in an extension, but say it's required or, um, or put it in the struct itself. Uh, I guess another question here is whether this is something that needs to be addressed in the protocol document. Um, in principle, you could have, um, you know, an extension, you know, if we did this as an extension, you could do it as an extension um, and not have the semantic defined in the base document, but um, require, um, you know, have the extension itself, you know, do the required behavior changes. Um, in which case you wouldn't need, you might not need to have that in the, the base protocol specification. In other words, we could punt on this. Well, so I'm, uh, my question there is then if you punt and it's required to be supported, then it's going to get stuck anyways, right? Because the IST is going to be like, whoa, you got a reference you got to fill out. Because well, no, no, wouldn't no, this I, end up being a normative reference and then you got stuck waiting to get it done? I, I don't think so. I think that the what the question I'm I'm raising is whether whether we even need to have this as a normative reference. Um could you have an extension later that um you know change the the behavior of the clients so that they implemented this this sort of requirement stuff? Um maybe that's just something to think about as we I, I think it's probably worth writing up a PR here in any case. And then we can think about, do we actually need to do this? I think that's a fair way forward. All right, so I've right. updated the issue and uh, Rohan, you're in there as to generate a PR. Obviously I'll let you and how, what all ends up getting done, figure that out. But um, I think the, the the request for the functionality was received and we are going to try to see how to address it is the yeah. summary um, of all this. Um, okay, so the other thing is that I know that the chairs need to do a review of this draft at some point. Um, I plan to do that as part of the working group last call because I'm probably mostly just gonna find nits um, like editorial things and you know you need to put this reference here and that kind of stuff. So I'm probably gonna hold off on doing those before we issue any kind of working group last call. We'll note, um, Rohan did send an, an email message about some normative reference um, that are, you know, need to be fixed or, and or are missing. So it would be good if there's, you know, you could fix those um, before we go out. But like I said, I'll probably going to hold off on hitting you guys with the, if I was going to be an RFC editor for a day, what would I want to get changed in this draft? Um, but again, it, we're getting down to the point where it's speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, you don't actually have to do that, but you know, it's like we said, it's going to get harder and harder to make changes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we got about, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm super pleased that all of the changes we talked about today are kind of around the edges of the protocol and not in the core. Um, so I think that's an encouraging sign. Um, and just for, for your reference, Sean, um, there are some issues outstanding in the, in GitHub that are all that are editorial in nature. I was planning to hand, handle those along with um, working group last call stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Just if you can make, um, if you wouldn't mind making a tag, so we can just make it make them editorial, so people aren't like, oh, you didn't like, you know, get get that out of the way. Um, and again, I just want to say that you know, this is if, if we actually do go out the door with this protocol, this has been an enjoyable protocol development experience where there's been relatively few, uh, you know, uh, raised voices during this entire time. So I mean, it's a little early, but uh, 
just want to say thanks everybody for keeping it professional. Um, I am going to try to get with Benjamin um, to figure out if there's a time that we can actually get the architecture draft in front of everybody. And that might be another interim, maybe at the end of October or something. Because I do think that we actually need to, you know, potentially go through that in any of the open issues that need to be done. Because again, primarily what I really want to make sure is that, you know, we made this pact with the security researchers that they were going to review our protocol and they were going to be happy before we shipped it. So I really kind of want like an explicit notification of like, hey, you guys did as good as you can and you explained how to put all the stuff together to get a generally secure protocol. Um, I think I would have heard about that before this point, but I think it would be good to get, you know, get get on record to say that like things look good as we've written it up so that um, I can point to that in my Shepherd write up and that we can make sure that the pack that we made um, remains intact. And I think a lot of that, you know, the reason why I think the architecture draft is important there is because that's kind of the entry point for people to start looking at things. And I'd really like to, if possible, point to, uh, you know, the security research uh, results either there or in the protocol draft to give people warm and fuzzies if it's possible. So Sean, I might suggest you, if you're pondering having an interim, just go ahead and get it on the calendar. Um, then we can cancel it if we need to. Yeah, I just gotta, I gotta, I gotta check to see what. I can't even remember if he's still in Paris or if he's moved to, you know, if he if he's moved. I'm just trying to make sure I get a time zone that kind of works for people, um, and get explicit confirmation that that they'll be there. Uh, in any event, um, again, thanks for today. We're gonna wrap up a little five minutes early. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Blink, stop.